Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we continue talking about GPU programming, and in particular, we are going to introduce a new parallel pattern, histogram calculation. Histograms, as you may know, are extremely useful in many different fields, such as image processing. Together with histograms, we will also uh, talk in detail about the evolution of atomic operations over the uh, architecture generations, because they are so important for the generation of histograms. Before we go into the details about the histograms, let me very quickly remind you what we covered in our previous lecture. We talk about another parallel pattern, uh, the reduction operation. As you may remember, a reduction is an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value. And it uses an operator that might be addition, product, minimum, maximum, this operator needs to have some properties. It needs to be associative, commutative, and have an identity value. For example, in the case of addition, this identity value is zero. As you may know, reduction is a key primitive for parallel computing, for example, in the map reduce programming model. Remember that we talk about how to generate, the, uh, how, how to calculate a reduction. First of all, uh, starting with a sequential reduction. In a sequential reduction, what we are going to do is obtaining a single value, the reduction result from uh, all the values of an input array. Let's imagine that we have an array of n elements. This will require us n iterations of this simple code where we go to the array, read the element and accumulate in some accumulator in this, in this slide, this accumulator is called sum. The good thing here is that there are many independent operations. So it's possible to uh, create a parallel implementation that can calculate multiple partial sums and then reduce them. In parallel machines, we keep, such as GPUs, for example, we typically use tree-based reduction. In a tree-based reduction on GPU, what we would do is dividing the input array into the available thread blocks, such as thread block zero and thread block one, and then internally we uh, divide the assigned chunk to the thread block to the different threads or different uh, warps, as you see. <clears throat> then we are going to iteratively perform partial uh, reduction operations where we will obtain some partial results that we use, uh, we keep in some temporary storage such as shared memory or registers. At some point, we will need to synchronize because threads from one warp may need to access values, partial results generated by threads of other warps. And that's what we are going to do with an intra-block synchronization, this uh, sync threads uh, function. We continue with the execution. Remember that in this tree-based reduction, half of the threads, half of the active threads retire when we go from one iteration to the next iteration. At some point, we will need to uh, synchronize again. <clears throat> and finally, we would obtain, we will obtain a single reduction or partial reduction per thread block. After that, we need to do some sort of interblock synchronization. Something uh, that we can do is terminating the kernel and moving all the partial results to the CPU and then performing the final reduction on the CPU. Or if we have many of these partial reductions, what we can do is launching a new kernel, like in a recursive manner, manner to perform again the tree-based reduction on GPU. And another possibility is to use atomic operations in global memory, because we have a single value per thread block. We could have one thread of this thread block using a global, uh, an atomic operation to global memory and accumulating the final reduction result in uh, some uh, memory position in global memory. The way that we uh, map the way that we map the computation in this uh, parallel reduction to the available threads might uh, determine clearly what's going to be the performance of our work. For example, we could go for a simple naive mapping, such as this one, where we are only using uh, even number threads. And uh, from the start, uh, we tell each of the even number threads to add two, uh, two uh, numbers, this, uh, the, the number uh, corresponding to it and the uh, nearby number. And uh, in the next, uh, so we perform and, and accumulate the partial results and, and some uh, temporary storage. In the next iteration, half of the threads retire, and we continue adding values and obtaining partial sums, partial, uh, partial reductions until we uh, get to the final value. The problem with this kind of naive mapping is that it causes low SIMD utilization. And this low SIMD utilization, in the end, is going to cause um, low performance or bad performance. Why that happened? Because when threads start retiring iteration after iteration, observe that 
uh, all, th all warps keep active, but most of the threads remain idle in each, uh, in each warp. And that essentially causes a lot of warp underutilization or loss in the utilization. How can we avoid this warp underutilization? We can uh, try like a smarter divergence free mapping where the active threads belong to the same warp or to the same warps. And in this case, what we are going to use is uh, uh, use uh, uh, threads for, to perform the partial reductions. We are going to use threads that are uh, consecutively numbered. And that means that they are going to belong to the same warp or to the same group of warps. And um, when they start retiring iteration after iteration, we would make sure that the remaining threads, the threads that continue being active, belong to the same warp. And here you can see the code with high SIMD utilization. And you can also see here in this figure how when from one iteration to the next iteration, half of the threads retire, those threads that remain belong to the same warp. And that increases um, the uh, warp utilization significantly and thus producing, producing much um, higher performance. Another interesting observation here is that as we uh, uh, make progress in the computation, iteration after iteration, there is a point where the active threads only need to access partial values that have been generated by threads in the same warp. And when that happens, we don't need anymore to go to shared memory and use sync threads. Why is that? Because these days, uh, newer architecture generations, GPU architecture generations provide warp shuffle functions. These are especially intrinsic that enable threads belonging to the same warp to share data with other threads in the same warp. And this is going to be faster than using atomic, um, sorry, than using shared memory and sync threads um, as we do in the initial iterations of the um, reduction operation. Uh, and there are different variants of these uh, warp shuffle functions. There is, for example, this um, uh, shuffle sync to uh, perform a direct copy from the index lane. There is this shuffle up sync to get the value from a, 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 a thread with a lower ID or from a higher ID or um, based on a bitwise XOR uh, of the own lane ID. And this is a code for the uh, war shuffle, the reduction with war shuffle, observe that in the very beginning, what we are assigning is an index uh, obtained based on what that is obtained based on uh, what's the uh, block ID and the threat ID. Here we declare the uh, space in, uh, in, in the shared memory to perform the or to accumulate the partial reductions. And in the very beginning, we have each thread already accessing two values from global memory, adding them and storing them in the uh, corresponding location in shared memory. After that, we synchronize and we go to this uh, reduction tree in, say, in shared memory. This is uh, essentially the same code as we have seen before for the, um, uh, let's say, efficient reduction operation with high SIMD utilization. Observe that uh, in each iteration, half of the threads retire. We keep accumulating, storing in shared memory, and then synchronizing uh, uh, because we, we, we have to make sure that all the active threads have already stored the partial value in the shared memory before we go to the next iteration. But at some point, we will have uh, only uh, 32 values to reduce, and that's the case where that's the point where we can start using the uh, shuffle uh, instructions because uh, only threads belonging to the same warp, as you see, all those thread ID, uh, all those threads with thread ID lower than warp size, that is 32. So all the active threads in this part of the code belong to the same warp. And there is where we can use this shuffle down sync in order to perform, in order to access the partial results generated by other threads in the same warp that are now stored in this variable that will be in a register. Um, we, uh, we, we read this value using, uh, in this case, shuffle down sync and accumulate. And we don't even need to um, synchronize or, um, or access uh, shared memory anymore in this inner loop. And finally, we will obtain a partial sum per thread block. We can accumulate this partial sum in an output array for a, either a, a later uh, kernel call or a, re, a final reduction in the CPU, but we could also replace this accumulation here 
with a global um, with a, a, an atomic operation to global memory uh, to accumulate the partial sums into a the final uh, reduction value in global memory. So um, a novelty with respect to I mean a, a recent novelty for the um, implementation of the parallel reduction in more recent most recent architectures is that they incorporate a new instruction natively supported that is a warp reduce and allows us to get rid of this inner loop that is highlighted in the slide. So uh, it only works for certain data types, for example, int, but um, if that's the case, then uh, we can make use of this warp reduce intrinsic. As I said, it's um, available only in the two most recent architecture generations in, since compute capability 8.0 with the Ampere architecture. And what we are doing is uh, uh, substituting the, um, the, the inner loop here using shuffle instructions with this reduce at sync that performs the final reduction natively using specialized hardware. So this is all related to the reduction. Remember as well that we introduced in a previous lecture, the atomic operations. Let me very briefly remind you what they are and how we can use them because we need to use them for histogram generation or histogram calculation with this, which is the parallel primitive that we are covering into this lecture. Remember that um, uh, CUDA provides uh, atomic instructions on shared memory and global memory, and they perform a read, modify, write operation atomically. Here you can see an example. This is an atomic app where uh, we identify the pointer to share memory or to global memory that um, uh, that, uh, that points this is a pointer that points to the atomic variable that we are going to update using the atomic function or the atomic operation this is the value that we are going to add and this is the return value in the case of uh, these atomic operations they return the old value uh, there are atomic operations for arithmetic for, for uh, arithmetic operations but also for bitwise operations for example and or an xor and also different data types you can go to the CUDA programming guide for the whole list of uh, atomic operations and data types. The drawback of atomic operations is that they may serialize execution when there are atomic conflicts. So for example, if we have two threads in the same warp that want to update two different memory locations in shared memory or in global memory, they can perform the update at the same time. They can perform this read, modify, write, which is atomic, but because there is no contention, they can do it at the same time. However, if they want to update the same value, either in shared memory or in global memory, what's going to happen is that the access needs to be serialized. The update is serialized, and this entails an extra latency due to the uh, atomic conflict. We also uh, discussed in a previous lecture that atomic operations have uh, interesting uses, uh, but uh, different uses as well. For example, they can be used for computation. We consider that they are used for computation when we use atomics on an array, on the elements of an array, that will be the output of the kernel. An example is the histogram that we are going to uh, study today, or the parallel reduction that um, we over in the previous lecture and just um, uh, recap on, on it in, in the beginning of this lecture. But atomic operations can also be used for synchronization when the uh, atomic operations are performed on memory locations that are used for synchronization or coordination or communication ac across threads. Examples of that are uh, counters, logs, flags, etc. We are going to see uh, some examples today and we will uh, see more examples in later lectures as well. Atomic operations are important for uh, have a functionally correct program because they, they are used to prevent data races that may happen when more than one thread needs to update the same memory location. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with data races, but then let's very briefly um, uh, remind everyone what uh, data races are. A data race occurs when multiple threads access the same memory location concurrently without ordering, and at least one access is a right. Uh, these data races may result in unpredictable program output. Let's see one example. Let's imagine that we have two threads, A and B, and they are creating a histogram. They are updating uh, some beans and based on the particular, uh, this particular B that they are using to index these uh, beans that 
as I said, maybe uh, and, and a histogram. So they access this uh, array of beans, they load it into this variable, they put the corresponding value into this variable, then they uh, increment in this case, they obtain a new value, and finally they write the new value in the original position in uh, the in memory, right? Uh, and and, and uh, you can observe that thread A and thread B are doing exactly the same computation. And these two threads A and B might belong, for example, to uh, the same warp. And so they execute concurrently. Um, what the problem that we have here is that if both threads have the same B, they will have to update the same location in the array beans. And um, if these array beans, in these beans B, uh, is uh, initially zero, the final value of these two codes executing concurrently in two, on two different threads, the final value might be two or might be one. It depends. As you know, the correct result would be two, but if uh, data risk happens, then the correct, the, the, the result will be only one. Let's see, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the two cases um, in this example. So this might be one case, this is another case, as you see, the difference between these two is that in one case, one thread um, uh, executes the three instructions one after the other, and then the other one goes and executes the three instructions one after the other. They might be executing concurrently, or they might be executing like a few cycles uh, of difference. And um, if that is the case, then uh, uh, as you see, first of all, one thread executes the, the three instructions, then another thread executes the other three instructions. And in these two scenarios, the final value will be two. So the result will be correct. However, um, uh, what may happen as well is that uh, the instructions as they are executed by the different, by the two threads in this case, they may be interleaved. And if that happens, and observe that in these two cases, what is happening is that all threads, or the two threads A and B, are reading beans B before the other thread has updated bean B. So uh, here is when read uh, thread A reads. Here is when thread B reads. Then they both update, and then they both write. So the problem is that because they both re uh, read the same old value and both are incrementing this old value, uh, in the end, both are writing the same result. And the same happens in, the, in, the, in this code in the, in the lower part. So in the two scenarios and many other different combinations of how the instructions are uh, executed over time, the final value of beans B will be one and then it will be wrong. So one way of solving this to avoid these data races is to um, use, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to, 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 to have access is, to, is essentially to create a critical section to ensure that it's going to be a mutual exclusion. And um, that's what we normally do in CPUs when we use locks or mutexes. So if we have different threads running on the same or different CPU cores, but they have to update the same array beans, what we can do is lock in the access to uh, these array bean, and after performing the update, unlocking the access. Two different threads cannot be at the same time inside the lock, inside the critical section, so this way we prevent the data races. However, this uh, idea of using locks is not really very uh, good idea in CMD processors because it may cause deadlock. The reason is that the different threads in a C executing in a CMD fashion are uh, accessing at the same time. So they could be accessing the logs at the same time. And we should come up with some way of uh, dealing with these and avoiding the deadlocks. We are going to see uh, later today uh, some of these ways of avoiding these deadlocks. But for now, if you want to uh, see how a fine-grained multi-thread architecture uses mutexes, I can recommend you to take a look at the AppMem uh, PIM architecture. In AppMem, the, 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 the PIM cores that are called DRAM processing units or DPUs are fine-grained multi-threaded. So, and they can um, run multiple hardware threads, up to 24 hardware threads. You may want to learn about this architecture by watching one of our lectures, some of the lectures in our processing in memory course. For example, in this lecture two, uh, in this semester, we uh, presented 
the architecture and uh, of the of, of this uh, abdomen beam and uh, the uh, pipeline of this fine grain multi threaded core. Uh, <clears throat> the threads that run on this pipeline can use mutexes for concurrent read modify write operations in a similar way as uh, CPUs do. Um, you may want to learn more about this architecture, about how to use mutexes. Um, if you take a look at our paper, uh, there you will see that we have uh, experimented with these mutexes. This is an example of how to generate a histogram, two different ways of generating a histogram, one of them using mutexes <coughs> on this architecture. These are some of the uh, experimental results that you can find in our paper. Atomic operations have evolved over time. The GPU ISA uh, has evolved uh, over the architecture generations. The syntax of the INCUDA of the atomic operations doesn't uh, really change. Probably the PTX, which is an intermediate representation and intermediate ISA also doesn't change or doesn't change that much. Here you can clearly see that this is an atomic operation on shared memory and for forming an addition on uh, unsigned in of 32 bits, but the assembly code, the, the, the machine code that really runs on the uh, GPU has uh, actually changed over time. In the, for example, in the atomic operations in shared memory, the three uh, first uh, CUDA enabled architectures, Tesla, Fermi, and Kepler use uh, these uh, kind of, uh, you know, like lock, modify, and, um, and uh, unlock loop where they perform multiple uh, iterations until all threads of the warp had updated the corresponding memory locations. Uh, after Maxwell, uh, the atomic operations start being, uh, to shared memory, start being natively supported as you see. And as you will see later, much uh, greater efficiency and performance. We are going to talk in more detail about the, these atomic operations in shared memory and how they have evolved, but first, we are going to uh, talk about the uh, parallel pattern that is the uh, most important topic today, the histogram calculation. So remember, he, uh, atomic operations can be used for computation, can be used for synchronization. Histogram is a good example of how to use them for computation, but we already talked in our previous lecture about how to use them for reduction. Remember that I mentioned that there are uh, seven different versions of the parallel reduction in the CUDA samples. Very uh, interesting exercise to go over all these seven versions to understand the different optimizations that they are that are applied and see how the performance of the code, performance of the parallel reduction greatly increases optimization after optimization. I mentioned as well that I modified three of these implementations to replace the uh, tree-based reduction with just one uh, atomic operation to shared memory. And actually we observed quite good performance results, especially in the most, uh, in the newest architecture that we has, had tested that was Maxwell. And we saw uh, interesting performance improvements over the uh, original versions and also um, a way of implementing uh, the parallel reduction with uh, fewer lines of code. So um, there are some advantages and, 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 and these, performance improvement was due to <clears throat> the fact that atomic operations to share memory were greatly improved in the Maxwell architecture. In the Maxwell architecture. But uh, as I said before, we are going to talk about that later uh, in this lecture. Uh, we did a very thorough analysis of the search space of parallel reduction with 85 different version possible, versions possible and um, with compiler support for automatic generation of these uh, parallel reduction using uh, warp shuffle primitives, warp shuffle operations, and atomic instructions. This is a paper that we presented to the CEO 2019 and definitely a very recommended reading. So let's talk about how to compute histograms. But before we start discussing the parallel implementation of the histogram computation, let's recap on what's a histogram. Histogram is a frequently used computation for reducing the dimensionality and extracting notable features and patterns from large data sets. They are uh, widely used in, for example, image processing for feature extraction, also used in, in fraud detection and many other fields. 
Um, in a basic histogram, what we do is going over all the elements in the input data set and identifying what's the bin that we have to increment. That's essentially based on what's the actual value of the element that we are uh, reading. So in a histogram, we are going to have, let's say in the default histogram, what we have is the number of bins uh, that is exactly the same as all possible values that the number of possible values that the input elements may have. For example, in image processing, if we are working on 8-bit uh, images or images where the pixels have a, a depth of um, 8 bits, uh, we can have in total 256 different values. So the size of the histogram in this case is going to be 256. So when generating the histogram, first thing to do is reading the element of the uh, input uh, data set, um, uh, checking what's the value, and then based on that, generating what's the bin that we need to update. Each bin is a counter, or we can say that each bin has an a counter associated. So what we do is for each input element, we identify the bin and then we increment the counter for that bin. Uh, this increment might be, or typically is um, adding one, but in some cases we may also add more than one. In the end, this is an associative and commutative operation. So we can uh, perform it in different ways. The way of generating a uh, histogram uh, in a sequential manner is to go over all the elements of the input array, checking what's the value, uh, figuring out what's the histogram that we need to update, and then uh, update the corresponding histogram. In this case, we are going to generate the histogram for this sentence. I calculate a histogram, and the histogram itself is here at the bottom, where you can see the all possible values that we can have in the letters of this sentence. If we do a sequential reduction, a sequential histogram calculation here, in the first iteration, we'll have four thread going to the first element of the input array, identifying it. This element is i, so we go to the corresponding bin and increment. Then we go to the uh, second uh, character in this case, say in iteration two, iteration three, iteration four, and so on and so forth. The uh, code for a sequential histogram function, as is, or the sequential histogram function, as you can see here, is pretty simple. The only thing that we have to go, we have to do is going over all the elements of the input array, reading one value, and then uh, going to the corresponding bin of the histogram and incrementing it. After that, we go to the next element and we continue doing it until we have visited the whole input array. But what if we want to implement this in parallel? It's something that we can do, right? Because we can read many of the input elements at the same time and then updating, why not, uh, some uh, uh, of the uh, beans in the, in the uh, output histogram. So let's assume that we have four different threads because we want our parallel implementation uh, to be efficient on GPUs. What we are going to do is with these different uh, four different threads, they are going to access nearby memory locations in order to make sure that the accesses to the input array are coalesced. And now they start performing updates. So for example, uh, thread zero is uh, uh, reading this I from memory. So it goes and increments the corresponding bin, bin I in the histogram or thread one is uh, reading one space. So it goes and increments the uh, element in, uh, so the, 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 the bin corresponding to the space and, and so on. And this is the corresponding code to this parallel implementation. Remember that we are working with uh, GPUs, so uh, we have to create a GPU kernel that we uh, define using this global qualifier. Uh, in the beginning of the um, kernel, we uh, obtain one index that is based on the one index, that is the index that we are going to use to, to access the input array, and this index is obtained based on the block ID and the thread ID. So we go to the input array, read the value, and then update the corresponding value of the histogram. However, this code, even though it uh, looks good and uh, probably uh, could be efficient, but is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because in some cases, uh, when, um, so in, in the second iteration, uh, in some cases, there might be conflicts as we are going to see. But let's uh, continue with our 
processing here in the second iteration, the four threads go to the next four um, elements of the input array, and they, then they update the same position, the corresponding beams in the histogram. But now observe that these thread zero and thread three have to update the same element in the histogram. And the problem is that this would cause an atomic conflict or a data race, as we know. So we need to use atomic operations here to make sure that the histogram is correctly calculated and our program is functionally correct. So what we do is modifying all wrong code with a correct code that replaces the increment uh, of the, of the uh, being of the histogram with an atomic operation that performs an atomic read, modify, write to the corresponding being of the histogram, as you can see on the slide. But as I said before, the problem with atomic operations is that they may serialize the execution and these might be extremely costly if these atomic operations happen directly to glo in global memory. Why is that? Because global memory is DRAM, is off chip, and um, it takes a while to go, several hundreds of cycles, as you may know, um, to go to the global memory, bring some value, bring it to the core, update, and then write back. And, and here you have some simplified representation of that. Imagine that we have uh, two threads that want to up update the same uh, location in the in the NRAM in the in the in the DRAM, so there will be some DRAM delay to uh, some latency to fetch uh, the value from uh, the, from DRAM from the global memory. Then there is a transfer delay over the uh, memory channel over the uh, off chip uh, bus that brings the data to the processor itself to the GPU. Then there is some internal routing, and then here. In a few cycles, we can perform the update. But then we have to write back, uh, going through the internal routing, transfer delay over the um, memory channel, and then DRAM delay, the DRAM latency to write uh, one element. And then we would do the uh, same for the next atomic operation, maybe performed by another thread in the same warp, updating the same global memory location. As you see, very costly because most of the time what we are paying is the data movement from bringing data to the processor to the, um, the sim delays and then writing it back hardware improvements that happen over time the fermi architecture uh, improved significantly the execution of atomic operations in global memory because then uh, the atomic uh, the, because then it, it was possible to directly perform the atomic operations in the uh, L2 cache. So in that case, we can uh, significantly reduce these um, data transfers uh, because accessing something that is in L2 is going to take uh, way less cycles, like an order of magnitude less cycles than going to the off-chip DRAM. But still, this is costly because uh, the L2 is still relatively far from the cores. It's uh, pretty large, so the latency uh, of its access is, is, is relatively high, and, and also we keep having serialization. So another additional way of improving the performance here is performing the atomic operations on shared memory. In those cases where we can modify your code such that instead of updating values in global memory, we update values in shared memory that is closer. But of course, this requires work from the programmers um, and, and, and modification of the algorithm as we will see. So histograms, as I said before, are widely used in image processing. Uh, we may want to do some computation before voting, before updating the histogram, but essentially the simple uh, code is uh, something like this. We go to the input image, we read one pixel of the image, we maybe perform some computation, obtain some value, and then with this value, we index the histogram and update the uh, corresponding histogram B. This will be the um, um, image histogram in a sequential manner. If we want to do it in parallel, we can do it as well. But as we know, we have to be careful because there might be uh, conflicts here. And that's why we need to use atomic operations. And actually, these atomic conflicts are going to be pretty um, uh, frequent in natural images uh, when we are processing natural images, because natural images uh, show some spatial similarity of the pixel values. And that here you see a very uh, nice example in the forehead of this uh, woman here. We see that 
all the pixels have very similar values. If we go directly to the exact uh, values that we have in the pixels, we see that in some cases nearby pixels have exactly the same value. So what that means is that this it's going to uh, there's going to be an atomic conflict for sure because probably we would assign we will assign threads of the same warp. Uh, to read these pixels and to update the corresponding histogram beans. So there will be an atomic conflict and there will be serialization. And one way of dealing with these atomic conflicts is using multiple subhistograms. And that's something that we can do because uh, in the uh, computation of histogram, we are using an operator that is associative and is commutative. So we can generate multiple histograms multiple subhistograms and then merge them all or reduce them all. So that's uh, something that because now we have more beans that we can update, uh, probably these two thread, this thread will go to one subhistogram, this thread will update the same bean but in another subhistogram. So we are avoiding uh, the conflict. We are reducing the frequency of the atomic conflicts by using multiple subhistograms. And this optimization technique is typically called privatization. So in privatization is an optimization technique where multiple private copies of an output are maintained when uh, and then the global copy uh, is updated on completion. So after we have created the private copies, we merge them. As I said before, this is um, uh, possible to do when we have an operator that is associative and commutative. That's the case in a histogram because we are using additions to update the histogram <coughs> and has the advantages that reduces the contention, the atomic conflicts on the uh, global copy. And also if the output is small enough, we can have the private copies in shared memory. And as we know, accessing, updating, um, um, the, the, the elements of the histogram, the beans of the histogram in shared memory is going to be faster because the access latency is significantly smaller than going to the uh, global memory. So uh, that's essentially what we are going to do. We divide the image for which we want to create a histogram into multiple chunks. We assign each of these chunks to different thread blocks. And then each of these different thread, thread blocks are going to have their own subhistogram hopefully shared memory because shared memory is not too large, but probably is enough to uh, keep a 256 bin histogram or even larger. Uh, so we create these uh, local subhistograms and at the end of the kernel, we perform a parallel reduction uh, in order to obtain the final histogram in global memory. We can combine the privatization with another interesting optimization technique that is coarsening. In this case, what we do is using a, a fixed number of thread blocks, a number of thread, block, thread blocks that is large enough to occupy the whole uh, GPU and keep all GPU cores active. But um, what these thread blocks are going to do is going <clears throat> over the whole image chunk by chunk of the image. For example, here in this um, uh, figure, we see that block zero accesses this part of the image and then this part of the image, and then this part of the image, and so on and so forth. So in total, in this simplified representation, we would be using only four thread blocks. What that means is that we only need to create four subhistograms that we only need to initialize one, and we, all, we will only have to reduce uh, into the uh, parallel, uh, into the uh, final histogram once. If we have more thread blocks, we will need to, we will have more subhistograms and then the parallel, the final parallel reduction will be uh, costlier. And here you can see the code for the parallel histogram kernel with privatization and coarsening. Uh, as usual, we start with the thread ID, the global thread ID based on the block ID and the local thread ID. <clears throat> we are also going to use this stride that is the total number of uh, threads and we declare the a private per block subhistogram, and then we do some subhistogram initialization. This means um, uh, initializing all the beans of the uh, histogram with the identity value that in this case is a zero. After this is done, uh, all the beans of the his local histogram are equal to zero or the private histogram are equal to zero. We synchronize and now we can start um, executing the main loop going to the um, input image or the uh, input array, 
reading one element, um, every uh, thread in the, in the warp and every thread in a thread block reads a different element from the image and or the input and then updates the corresponding being of the uh, private subhistogram. After that, after we are done with this uh, main loop, we synchronize to make sure that all threads of the block have updated uh, the corresponding beans of the histogram based on the input elements that they read. And after that, we will perform the final reduction, in this case, using directly atomic operations in global memory. Um, so we, we perform this uh, final reduction to obtain the final um, histogram in global memory, that is this histo array. So as you see, this um, um, optimization, this privatization and coarsening is uh, relatively easy to use. And we are going to, I'm going to show you some uh, performance results later. You'll see that it really produces very uh, good performance improvement compared to just having a single histogram in global memory and having to update uh, all these, the, the beans of this histogram uh, always in global memory. But we can go even farther in the optimization of uh, the use of atomic operations for histogram calculation. We can use warp synchronous programming for atomic operations. Warp synchronous programming uh, essentially means using warp shuffle instructions and other uh, important primitives that work at a warp level. You are already familiar with warp shuffle instructions because I mentioned them in the beginning of the <laughs> lecture. Warp shuffle, these warp shuffle functions allow threads uh, of one warp to access data uh, that um, belongs to threads in the same warp. And this can be, this is pretty useful for communication across threads, but there are other useful warp synchronous primitives, for example, this uh, sync warp that forces the reconvergence of threads in the mask. Um, this active mask that returns a mask of converged threads. Essentially, this active mask is going to give us a 32-bit um, bitmap um, corresponding to uh, the, the, each bit in the bitmap corresponding to uh, each of the threads in the, the 32 threads in the warp. And depending on whether these threads are active or not, the corresponding bit of the mask or the bitmap uh, will be uh, set or not. There is uh, also these uh, other two uh, primitives here, all sync and anything that return true if all or any of the participating threads pass true. There is this also this ballot sync that returns the mass of threads that pass through, or we also have this match all sync that returns true if all participating threads pass the same value or this match any sync that returns the mass of participating threads passing the same value. So it's going to return a mask uh, that will have one in the corresponding bit if the corresponding thread has the same value here as other threads in the warp. So by using some of these uh, warp synchronous primitives, we can create what we call the coalesce atomic operation that can, um, um, that can kind of performing a, a local reduction per warp or several local reductions per warp, and then um, uh, updating a particular uh, location in shared memory or global memory uh, using an atomic operation. But good thing here is that we can use a parallel reduction instead of just serializing all the time in cases where we are going to have a, um, say a relatively high uh, conflict degree, or we're going to have multiple threads in the warp conflicting because they are accessing the same memory locations uh, by using these coalesce atomic operations, we can greatly uh, reduce the latency of the operation. But let's very, very quickly take a look at this atomic add function that would be called by threads executing our GPU kernel. Observe that in a similar way as, uh, as we do in, in, the, in the atomic operations themselves, uh, we have a pointer to the uh, memory element, memory position that we want to update. And we have this value that is the value that we want to add to this uh, pointer. But we, have, we may have multiple threads in the warp that want to update the same memory position. So what we do is, first of all, obtaining an active mask to see what threads in the warp are really going to execute this um, atomic add function. And then we use this match 
any sync to create a mask for all threads that need to update the same element, either in shared memory or in global memory. So we are going to create a mask here that we are going to use later. Where? Exactly here. We call another function that is reduce warp. Maybe we could directly use a, a native uh, reduce function that already exists since uh, Ampere. So uh, we uh, call this reduce mask, uh, reduce warp with the active mask, that is those threads that have the same pointer to update and, um, and, and, and each of these threads uh, contributes its own value. We perform the parallel reduction here for, uh, for all those active threads, obtain some value. And this is the value that one of the active threads is going to be in charge of um, uh, adding to the uh, corresponding memory location that is pointed by this pointer here. In this case, using an atomic add because we may have threads in other words that want to update also the same memory location. Observe that the way to identify what thread is going to execute this atomic add, we use this first, um, uh, it's a, uh, uh, first, um, Bit set. I don't exactly remember this FFS, what it means, but it's like the, um, the first bit that is set in the active mass. So that is the, uh, uh, the bit with the uh, lowest index that is active. And, um, and, and, and if uh, one particular thread identified by this link is that bit that is active with the lowest index, then it goes, this is the one that is designated to uh, update the corresponding uh, location in global memory. And finally, the only thing that we need to do is using this uh, shuffle sync just for the uh, uh, for the other active threads to read uh, this value, that is the return value of the atomic operation, read it uh, from uh, the uh, lane that performed uh, the update. So, <clears throat> We are for now done with um, the, how to calculate histograms in parallel using uh, GPU, how to use atomic operations, how to alleviate the cost of atomic operations with uh, privatization, also combined with coarsening. And finally, we have even seen uh, a way fancier uh, way of uh, uh, creating more efficient atomic operations with these coalesce atomic operations that essentially uh, check what are the active threads that need to update the same memory location, perform a partial reduction, and then use the atomic operation with the value obtained from this partial reduction. So as you see, there is a plethora of uh, ways of optimizing the use of atomic operations, essentially because atomic operations are costly. And um, they are costly because they serialize the execution. And that's something that programmers know, but also hardware designers know. And uh, because of that, uh, the, 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 the hardware the, and the architectural support for atomic operations has evolved in a very interesting way from the very beginning of the GPU com uh, computing era. And um, we are going to spend uh, a few slides talking about this uh, evolution of the architectural support <coughs> for atomic operations. We are actually going to start with shared memory. Remember that atomic operations are possible in global memory and in shared memory. Let's start with the atomic operations in uh, shared memory. Uh, you're already familiar with this. Uh, this is the syntax in CUDA. This is the uh, corresponding uh, instruction in the uh, PTX. This is an intermediate representation. And then in the SAS or assembly code, depending on the architecture, <coughs> we may have different instructions or different combinations of instructions to execute the same operation, in this case, uh, an atomic operation. As I mentioned before, uh, in Tesla, Fermi, and Kepler architecture, uh, there was this, uh, this loop that we are going to discuss in, in detail. But as you see, requiring four instructions. And also, there is a actually, there is a branch instruction here. What that means is that this loop might be executed several times 
and, 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 and as a result, we may have cases where the latency is pretty high, as, uh, as we will see, because we did some micro benchmarking. Since, Max, since Maxwell, we have um, native atomic operations in shared memory, at least for certain uh, data types and operations. Um, but let's first talk about uh, this log three mechanism for shared memory atomics that existed uh, in, from Tesla to uh, Kepler architectures. This is a, a pattern that explains uh, this log three mechanism. As you can see here, uh, we can identify this is a GPU core. Inside the GPU core, we have the shared memory. And if we take a closer look at this shared memory, we see that the storage resource, that is the memory array itself, is accompanied with this memory lock unit that contains some lock bits. And this memory lock unit with a memory lock unit with the lock bits is going to be in charge of executing this um, uh, lock free code uh, correctly. Let's talk a little bit more about these uh, lock bits. You already know that shared memory is an interleaved memory or bank memory organization. Uh, this is uh, bank zero, as you see, bank zero has uh, elements. Uh, we, we are assuming here, by the way, that there are uh, 32 banks in shared memory. So uh, this bank zero contains uh, address 0, 32, 64, 96, and so on, but also uh, this uh, address uh, uh, 1024, 1056, 2048, and so on. So as you see, the distance between these addresses is 32 because we have 32 shared memory banks. So this is bank 0, and these are the remaining 31 banks, as you see. So associated with these banks, uh, there are some lock addresses. And in total, uh, in the um, Fermi and Kepler architecture, we, we, we found out that there were uh, 1,024 different lock addresses and different lock bits. So what that means is that uh, each of the lock bits is assigned and uh, corresponds to multiple memory addresses. In particular, for example, this lock bit zero um, is uh, going to be used to atomically update this uh, address zero or address 1024 or address 2048 and so on and so forth. Um, and actually, if we take a closer look at the addresses themselves, uh, we can see that uh, part of the bits of the address are going to be used to identify the bank, to address the bank, to address the row in the bank, or to address what we call a page. A page is essentially a 1,024 uh, shared memory location, consecutive shared memory locations. So this would be, for example, address 1,056 is in uh, page one. It's uh, in in this row one, and is also is in bank zero, as you see. And if we check, for example, address zero is in page zero, row zero, and bank zero, or address 32 is in page zero, row one, and bank zero. Observe that all these three are in the same bank. So if we want threads in the same warp access, for example, just a read or a write operation access these three addresses, we would for sure have a bank conflict. And we know that bank conflict serialize the execution unless we have more than one port per bank, it's not possible for two threads uh, running concurrently to access memory locations in the same bank at the same time. Uh, so we have some serialization there, uh, but also observe that uh, if uh, the uh, row bits also uh, match between two addresses, is not only the bank, but is also this row, what we have is that the, the two addresses are sharing these 10 bits. And what that means is that they also share the uh, corresponding lock address and the corresponding lock bit. And we will see what are the implications of this. But before that, let's take a look at the assembly code for the shared memory atomics pre-Maxwell architecture. As I mentioned before, it's a lock-free mechanism that is based on predicated execution, and it needs to use four different instructions. The first one is this load and lock operation that perform a normal load uh, from shared memory, a, me a shared memory read, but also 
um, uh, tries to lock the access to the corresponding shared memory position by acquiring one lock bit. If the lock bit is acquired by the, the, a specific thread, then this uh, predicate register will be equal one. And because uh, this uh, uh, for loop is based on this, this uh, lock free mechanism is based on predicated execution, the execution of the next instruction is predicated to this uh, P0 uh, predicate bit. So if this is one, then the integral addition will be uh, executed and then uh, the store operation as well. And, and it's a, a store and a lock. So it uh, writes the, the value uh, obtained after the integral addition and then uh, unlocks the corresponding lock bit so that is uh, free and available for other warps that want to update the same memory location. Those that those threads that could not uh, update the corresponding position because they were not able to acquire the corresponding lock bit uh, have the opportunity to branch and start again uh, this uh, lock free loop and and try again to uh, update so the way that the lock bits are mapped to addresses in reality is linear as we have seen uh, two slides ago but in principle that could be replaced by a more sophisticated hash function. And that's something that we uh, actually tried and we are going to see um, uh, how, how we did it in a, in a few slides. But as you, as you see, that's um, essentially like uh, uh, recapping on, on what we have just covered. Let's imagine that we have this warp access pattern. We have uh, these uh, 32 threads belonging to the same warp that want to update these addresses in, in shared memory. If we check what are these memory addresses, we see that some of these, there will be uh, some uh, conflicts for sure, because um, uh, some of the, uh, let's say, bits 11 to 2 uh, are the same for several of these addresses, like, for example, these indicated by, by the blue arrows or the red arrows, there are conflicts there. Uh, so what that means is that there is contention when trying to acquire the lock bits, and that's going to make that the uh, accesses are serialized and the execution of the atomic operations are uh, is serialized. Here in this slide, you see a very detailed uh, execution timeline. Uh, we can identify in the warp access pattern that we have uh, clearly an atomic conflict because these three zero and three uh, thread zero and thread four need to update the same. Uh, address address zero, but we also have uh, thread one, five, and six that want to uh, update addresses that reside in the same memory bank, like uh, also these two, thread two and three, these two are also uh, going to update uh, memory addresses, memory locations in the same bank. So we are going to see how this um, is resolved by the uh, by using this uh, lock free mechanism so very first thing all these threads belong to the same warp so they all together go to execute this load and lock instruction what happens is that not all of them uh, can uh, let's say perform the memory accesses at the same time because we have bank conflicts and also some of them are contending as well in the access to the lock bits so for example what happens here is that uh, because thread, sorry, address zero and address 32 are in the same shared memory bank or address one and address 33 are in the same shared memory bank. We have a bank conflict, so we cannot access uh, these two until these other have been uh, already accessed. Same thing happens here with uh, address 1024 and also with address 1056 because all of them are in the same in the same shared memory bank. Also observe that there are some uh, atomic conflicts uh, due to uh, some threads that want to update memory locations that are sharing the lock address and the lock bits. For example, these uh, address zero, address zero, and address 1024. So for sure, only one of the three threads will be able to, uh, uh, to get the corresponding lock bit lock that memory location for itself and update that memory location. So those threads, for example, in this case, we assume that it was uh, thread zero that um, uh, got the lock bit. So thread zero can perform the predicated addition, same as other threads that uh, don't have 
any conflict. And then after that, uh, writing, storing into the global memory, the uh, uh, value obtained after the uh, addition and unlocking and releasing uh, the locks. And then the uh, execution of the branch instruction for those, in this case, three threads that could not acquire uh, the lock in the uh, lock unit. So as you see, uh, all these entail some base latency, but there are additional latencies due to the, in this case, the bank conflicts. And now we're going to have even more extra latency because some of the threads will need to execute the loop again, right? Uh, for example, here uh, for uh, threads uh, four, five, and six, four, five, and six, go to share memory again to read the corresponding uh, values in the corresponding addresses and also try to acquire the lock bits and then perform the predicated addition for those who really were able to acquire the lock bits. In this case, we are assuming that our thread th four and thread six. Um, so then they perform the uh, store uh, operation and release the corresponding lock. And same as before, there are some atomic conflicts in this process because uh, these, uh, for example, address 0, 1024, and 1056 belong to the same bank. So there are uh, bank conflicts there, and we have to pay that extra latency. Um, and in the end, in the final iteration, is only uh, the final uh, active thread is uh, five that already now can acquire the lock bit and perform the predicating addition, predicated addition, the predicated store, and, and just uh, simply doesn't execute this uh, branch uh, instruction because um, there, is, uh, there is no need to, to go again and, and try and in this uh, lock-free mechanism. So here you see the uh, detailed execution timeline for this um, uh, implementation of the atomic operations. And we really analyze that with a lot of detail using uh, different micro benchmarks. This is one of the very micro benchmarks that we use. Uh, observe that we are using this uh, clock function that returns the cycle count. And we are uh, repeating the atomic operation multiple times in order to average uh, the uh, measured latency and obtain, obtain uh, more reliable results with uh, our micro benchmark. Um, what we did in this uh, micro benchmark based analysis is to change the uh, values here in this input data in order to change the warp access patterns, in order to change the amount of conflicts, atomic conflicts, bank conflicts, or even lock conflicts, as we will see, uh, that we are going to find when uh, executing this code. So, for example, uh, one experiment that we uh, did was uh, changing the number of position conflicts. So here we call we call position conflict when we have two or more threads that want to update exactly the same memory address. And um, what we did, uh, we changed the pattern such we changed the pattern such that the number of threads updating the same memory location was increasing, and that's what we call an n-way position conflict. So if we have n threads that want to update the same shared memory location, we have an n-way position conflict. And we change the um, degree uh, of the conflict from 1 to 32. So here in this case, if it's 1, there are no threads colliding. There is no conflict. If uh, n-way is 32, means that all 32 threads of the warp want to update the same shared memory location. So every time that we increase the position, the, the, every time that we increase the, 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 the number, the, the conflict degree or the number of threads updating the same shared memory location, we see that the latency of the operation increases. And actually it increases in fixed steps of 120 cycles uh, on the architecture that we use for our experiments. We also did a different experiment uh, instead of uh, producing position conflicts with the pattern in the input array, what we do is producing bank conflicts. So in this case, what we have is every time that we increase the conflict degree, what we have is one more thread updating a memory location in the same bank, but not necessarily the same memory location as others. So it's like, uh, it's a, uh, for example, um, if uh, we have a single uh, thread 
updating a memory location in bank zero. Um, uh, this thread updates uh, address zero. If we have a two-way bank conflict, the other, the, the, the second thread, the, the second conflicting thread is going to update address 32. If there is a, a three-way bank conflict, then uh, the, the, the next thread is updating address 64 and so on and so forth. So as you see, we have bank conflicts, but there are no position conflicts here. So what we observe is that the latency increases as we increase the um, uh, conflict degree, but in this case, they increase the gap between these uh, two consecutive points is 32 cycles. Why is that? Because there is no really position conflict. It's only a bank conflict that will happen in the load operation and in the store operation, but we don't need to repeat this uh, loop of the lock free mechanism. However, if we change this stride and we make it larger, for example, 256, what we observe is that every time that we have four more threads uh, conflicting in the, uh, in the same bank, we also see that there is like a, a, a larger gap that is uh, indicated by these arrows. And, uh, and this larger gap is what we call the lock contention or lock conflict. That happens because after having, so because in this experiment, this thread is uh, 2056. So if we have four threads accessing the same bank with a stride to uh, 2050, 256, uh, that means that they are already using four different lock bits. If we add one new thread to conflict, to collide in the same bank, this thread will be accessing address 1024. And remember that address 1024 is sharing the same uh, uh, lock bit, the same lock address with address zero. And that means that we really have a, an atomic conflict because these two are sharing the lock bit. And that's what causes that we have these larger gaps from time to time. So this is uh, all the characterization that we need to understand how the uh, atomic operations in shared memory work in uh, uh, Tesla, Fermi, and Kepler architectures. And one of the key issues uh, why this happened is because the hash function that connected the memory addresses with the lock addresses was very simple uh, function. It was just like linear assignment. So one thing we could do is using configurable hash functions uh, here to change um, the hash function. And depending on the workload, uh, map the addresses to the lock addresses in a different way in order to avoid bank conflicts. And we um, experimented with this a potential uh, hash function that we could use is this XOR based hash function. As you see, what we are doing to obtain the lock uh, address and the bank address is to uh, XOR different bits uh, of the memory address based on that we can reduce significantly um, the number of bank conflicts and atomic conflicts. Uh, these uh, figures here, these graphs here uh, sh should look very familiar to you because they are uh, essentially the same thing that we have seen in the previous slides. This is a M-way bank conflict with the strike 32, observe that uh, this line here that uh, actually is uh, experiments on a real GPU, but also on a simulator GP GPU sim, as you see, uh, they match pretty well and they also match pretty well with the um, experiments that we have uh, discussed in the previous slides. This is the uh, similar results for bank conflicts with the strike uh, one, uh, 256, but remember that there are also lock conflicts here. That's why the final uh, lar the larger latency here with the highest um, M-way or 32-way bank conflict is larger than here. And uh, this green line in the two plots represents the latency obtained after having used our XOR-based hash function. And as you see, there is a 
huge reduction of these uh, latency. So that could be an efficient way of uh, optimizing the execution of atomic operations on shared memory by modifying with the minimal modifications to the existing hardware uh, by uh, using, let's say, a smarter hash functions here. That could, as I said, be configurable for different uh, workloads as well. Uh, and depending what are going to be the access patterns of these workloads, use different uh, hash functions. That's something that we explored in uh, our paper published and uh, IGP transactions of computers in 2016. So, yeah. Um, before, so uh, that's more or less how the atomic operations uh, work in shared memory. Based on that understanding, we were able to propose an optimization to go even farther uh, in the uh, histogram computation. The key idea is to continue using private subhistograms, but instead of using one single private subhistogram per block, we could use multiple private subhistograms per, per block. Uh, of course, depending on what's the size of the histogram and what's the available shared memory. Um, yeah, so the idea is that instead of using one subhistogram per block, as I said, we can use, for example, four. And in that case, what we would do is if we have four threads of a warp that want to update the same shared memory being, what they are going to do is updating the being in different uh, subhistogram. So for example, thread zero updates here, thread one updates here, thread two updates here, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, good thing is that that avoids the position conflicts because we are updating beans in different subhistograms, but still we have the issue, and that's quite normal because the number of lines that we have is, 30, is 32, and the size of a Histogram is also typically a power of two, like 256, or in this particular uh, slide, we are considering subhistograms of 32 bins. Um, so there are going to be, so in, in, in case that we have an access pattern like this, there are going to be bank conflicts and there are going to be lock, lock conflicts as well. So one thing that we could do to avoid these conflicts is to use some padding. As you see, we leave here some empty memory locations such that we shift the uh, mapping of uh, the subhistogram um, on the shared memory. And this way, if we have these four threads that want to update the same being in different subhistograms, they are also updating it in different shared memory banks and with different log bits. And that greatly improved the performance of the histogram computation on the older um, uh, GPU architectures. These are results for Fermi and Kepler with 100 natural images. Here we computed uh, different histograms of size uh, 64 and size uh, 256 in this particular example. And we changed this replication factor or number of private subhistograms per thread block from one to the maximum possible number of subhistograms or uh, privatized uh, histograms that we could fit in the shared memory. In the case of a histogram size of 64 bins up to 189 subhistograms per thread block, in the case of uh, 256 up to 47 uh, subhistograms per thread block. Remember that we are using not only this uh, replication of the uh, privatized copies, but also uh, we are using padding. And, and you can see how much uh, the execution time reduces as we increase the, uh, uh, this uh, replication factor, producing a very uh, interesting performance improvement. The thing is that uh, for Maxwell, the uh, hardware itself improved greatly because uh, atomic operations started to be supported natively by the hardware. And um, what happened is that we don't need anymore to uh, try these fancy optimizations using multiple uh, subhistograms per thread block and so on. As you see in Maxwell represented uh, the results by this green line, there is no, essentially no change in the performance, uh, regardless of whether we use one subhistogram in shared memory or 47 subhistograms in shared memory. As you see, uh, pretty interesting that the uh, performance remains uh, completely flat or almost uh, completely flat, the, the uh, execution time, because now we have uh, hardware support that efficiently 
executes the atomic operations in shared memory. And even have another example, a string compaction is a atomic operation based a string compaction. Uh, what we do here is just having a single counter per thread block is just one single memory location per thread block that is updated by all threads of the thread block when they need to uh, perform the uh, string compaction operation and observe that even with all threads of the thread block accessing the same shared memory location and updating atomically the, share, the same shared memory location, the execution time all increases from 0 0.33 to 0 0.77 in the case with, where we have the maximum, um, the, the, say, a degree of atomic conflict. And you can compare the executions on, my, on the Maxwell architecture to the execution of the Kepler architecture and see uh, how great the, the new hardware uh, improved uh, the performance of these uh, string compaction in this particular example. I don't have any figure representing these uh, atomic units near the uh, memory banks in, in the shared memory of NVIDIA GPUs, but something uh, pretty similar already uh, exists uh, in uh, AMD GPUs. These are, this is like, um, um, and figure from a white paper from, from the GCN architecture from 2012, where we can clearly identify these atomic units near the uh, memory banks uh, in the uh, equivalent to the shared memory in, in AMD uh, GPUs that is called the uh, load data share. Atomic operations have also evolved greatly uh, on uh, it's a, their execution to uh, on global memory. For example, in the Tesla architecture, the early GAT architecture from 2006, atomic operations were executed on DRAM. That means that every time that we wanted to execute an atomic operation, we had to go to the global memory, fetch one value, bring it to the core, perform uh, the, the increment, for example, or the addition, and then write back to the, to the DRAM. So that was uh, extremely costly. Um, in, in Fermi, as we mentioned before, the uh, performance was greatly improved because uh, the atomic operations were executed in L2 using atomic units near L2. And in Kepler, there is a further optimization in the hardware because these atomic units incorporate a sort of local buffer that even saves some accesses to the L2 itself and uh, thus producing uh, significantly better uh, performance. In Pascal, there were uh, even more architectural improvements with support to a 64-bit uh, floating point atomic add as well. So this is a, a, a one, a, we, we're going to take a quick look at these uh, atomic units near L2 with a local buffer. I'm not really sure if the actual implementation is the one uh, uh, that is explained in, in, in this patent, but, um, but uh, it's probably something uh, pretty similar. Here you can see that the L2 is divided into multiple partition units. Inside each of these partition units, we have the uh, array itself uh, of, the, uh, of the memory array, the L2 cache, and then we also have these arrow piece um, raster operators is the, is the meaning, and these arrow piece are the atomic units that are going to, that execute atomic operations near the L2. Uh, here we can take a closer look. This, this, this is the partition unit. This is the L2 cache. And here we have the arrow P. So if we take a even closer look at the arrow P, we can see here an ALU to execute the, um, the operation itself. For example, an, an addition, and here we can identify the local buffer. So a good thing of, uh, of this uh, hardware is that if we have two threads uh, executing concurrently and when they want to update the same global memory location, and assuming that these uh, global memory location, these global memory uh, values are already in shared memory because we have brought the cache uh, to the uh, L2, I said uh, shared memory and I meant uh, L2, so we bring one cache line to the L2, so the caching is already in L2, but now we have two concurrent threads that want to update the same location in this um, uh, local cache, sorry, in this cache line, so uh, the two threads start the, uh, so 
send their command to the uh, to the to this uh, arrow p this atomic unit near the l2 and uh, the first one will update the uh, corresponding value in the lu but they store the value the result in this local value in this local buffer for the next thread to take the value from the the, the intermediate result from this local buffer um uh, feed it to the uh, alu perform let's say in addition and so on and so forth. So we may have the 32 threads of the warp wanting to update the same memory location. This memory location is going to uh, reside all the time in this local buffer. So the access to it is going to be much faster with a way reduced latency, uh, even uh, significantly shorter latency that reading the cache line or reading the element from uh, DL2 because we are reading from even a closer uh, local buffer and the uh, overall latency of the thermic operation is uh, significantly reduced. We uh, run some experiment to understand how the uh, atomic operations to global memory evolved from Tesla uh, to uh, Maxwell architecture. And to do so, we uh, run an experiment where we apply two different uh, parallelization patterns. It, the computation is exactly the same, but in one case, we are using a scatter parallelization. In the other case, we are using a gather parallelization. Observe that the input and the output arrays are exactly the same. We have exactly the same number of threads. The difference between these two approaches is how we distribute the computation over the available threads. In the scatter parallelization, we assign one thread to each element of the input array, while in the gather parallelization, we assign one thread to each element of the output array. And what that means is that for every single thread in the scatter parallelization, after reading the element from the input, this thread needs to figure out what's the um, effect of the corresponding value of the input on all the different values of the output. So after reading this um, uh, element zero of the input array, this thread zero should go and update this uh, element zero of the output, element one, element two, element three, and so on and so forth. And that's the same for all other threads. And uh, in the gather parallelization, the way that we assign threads uh, to the uh, computation to the threads is the other way around. Here we are assigning threads to elements of the output array. So each thread needs to figure out what's the effect of all the elements of the input array um, what's the effect of all the elements of the input array uh, on the assigned output element, as you see. So what's the a key difference between these two implementations? As you can see, there is no contention in the access to the output here, where we are going to update these output elements frequently, while in the scattered parallelization, there is going to be contention for sure. And um, this contention, the only way of resolving this contention and having uh, functionally correct program is to use atomic operations. And that's what uh, we can see in our example codes. This is a code corresponding to the uh, scatter operation. Remember, we are assigning in the scatter uh, parallelization, we are assigning uh, input elements to the uh, threads. So each thread, uh, for, based on the block index and thread index, we obtain one index to access the input array, then we perform some uh, computation that is uh, out invariant, obtain some intermediate result. And with this intermediate result, we go over all the elements, these num out elements of the output array. We go over all the elements of the output array, um, obtain another uh, partial value here with this out dependent and update the corresponding uh, memory location, the corresponding element of the output array using an atomic operation. We need to do that because we will probably have multiple threads of the input, uh, multiple threads that having assigned different elements of the input, but they all have to update all elements of the output. And that's why we have to use atomic operations here. However, in a gather uh, approach, what we are doing is assigning to each thread one element of the output. So every thread uh, only needs to worry about its own element of the output, but needs to go over all the elements of the input, these num in elements of this in input array. So we read every input, uh, every element in the input array, obtain some intermediate result, then obtain, obtain some output dependent intermediate result, and then we update the uh, 
corresponding element in the uh, output array. And as you see, we are accumulating this outreg uh, for uh, that that comes uh, or or is produced by all the elements of the input. But in the end, the corresponding uh, thread just needs to update its own element in the uh, in the output. So that's why we don't need to use atomic operations here. So how about the evaluation? We run some experiments here. You can see execution time for the different versions, the scatter and gather. The difference between these two versions of scatter and gather is that we are changing the uh, access pattern and the way that the inputs affect the outputs uh, in a way that uh, here in this uh, experiment, there are no atomic conflicts, while here the number of atomic conflicts is significantly larger. And also the number of atomic conflicts uh, increases with the uh, size of the input arrays that, uh, uh, no, actually this is the size of the, uh, no, this is the size of the input arrays. So the larger the input array, we have more threads in the scatter approach. We have more threads trying to update the same um, uh, memory locations corresponding to the output arrays. And as and, and we run these experiments on the uh, Tesla, Fermi, Kepler, and Maxwell generations, and um, and and we see a kind of uh, very interesting results here. In the case of the Tesla, the oldest GPU architecture, because there is no well to cache and the execution of atomic operations happens in DRAM, uh, we see that when the conflicts start increasing, the execution time also increases uh, dramatically. But now we zoom in into this uh, plot in order to check uh, the results for the other architectures as well. We see that even in the case that there are no conflicts because we are uh, uh, we have to go to the to the uh, global memory very frequently. We see that. Uh, the, the, the latency or the execution time in Tesla is, is pretty high, even in Fermi, where we have uh, already atomic operations uh, in, in the L2, we have atomic units in L2, uh, the uh, um, uh, execution time increases a lot when the number of conflicts starts uh, increasing. Of course, this is much lower execution time than the execution time corresponding to uh, the Tesla architecture, but but it's still uh, way higher than the uh, execution time for the guard gather parallelization. But we go one step farther, and now we see that in Kepler there is a buffer uh, in the atomic units in L2. So that's why we managed to reduce the um, execution time even when we have conflicts for the scatter approach compared to Fermi and compared to uh, Tesla. Even some more performance improvement uh, in Maxwell, probably also due to higher frequency uh, of the course as well. Uh, but as you see, the interesting observation as well is the distance between the scatter approach and the gather approach also gets reduced over time, also gets reduced as the architecture and the hardware keeps improving. And um, let's say that the, the, the good thing is that uh, with the architectural and hardware improvements uh, for the atomic operations, it might make sense to start using atomic operations more because they are um, relative, so they are quite intuitive. And as we have discussed as well, for example, for um, the, the reduction operation, uh, we can uh, make programmers' life easier by writing less lines of code or, or avoiding fancy optimizations such as these multiple private subhistograms that we used once for the that histogram calculation. And the effect of hardware improvements is something that uh, we can see as well. This is a 256 being histogram of 100 and natural images. We are comparing here the performance of a, a shared memory based implementation of the histogram calculation with one private histogram uh, per block. We're comparing it to a single a histogram in global memory, um, and uh, we see that the execution time for the shared memory based implementation was way lower in Fermi. However, because in Kepler there was an optimization, a hardware optimization of the atomic operations in global memory, but not in shared memory, interestingly, the execution time was uh, quite the same uh, in both implementations. However, in Maxwell, the hardware uh, 
uh, of the uh, atomic operations in shared memory also improves um, due to these uh, native uh, atomic operations and shared memory. And we see how, again, the uh, execution time reduces significantly. And again, it really makes sense to use uh, one privatized histogram in shared memory instead of a single histogram in global memory. <clears throat> So this is all for today. I think it was a pretty long lecture because we covered the evolution of the atomic operations as well. I hope that you found it uh, interesting. Um, if you want to uh, learn more about the histogram calculation and atomic operations, you can take a look at this chapter nine in the book, Programming Massively Parallel Processors. Uh, this is all for, uh, from my side for today. Uh, I hope you uh, come back to these uh, lectures on heterogeneous systems. We will continue uh, e uh, next Tuesday uh, with uh, another parallel pattern. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>